you know what? Screw it. I'm typically a movie YouTuber. Hi, hello. I'm the guy that uses the obnoxiously sized text in thumbnails. My normal content is the likes of terrible movie reviews or cancelled movie productions, breakdowns of individual movie scenes, and knee-jerk trailer thoughts and opinions. But you know, I used to be a gaming essayist first, and games these days are getting more and more cinematic. And damn it, I'm gonna be playing this game whether I'm online or offline, so here it is. The scene that changed Tears of the Kingdom. And what I mean by that is we're going to dissect the expository new reveal of Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. But not for clues and secrets about gameplay and plot, though I'll happily regurgitate what I've heard from others. And instead, let's break down the camera techniques being used in the cinematography to highlight this trailer into one of the best the gaming industry has ever experienced. And for the sake of copyright, we're going to take a slightly non-chronological order. <laughs> So from a tonal perspective, this trailer has rounds. It starts off gentle, builds up in the middle, and then releases a climax before cooling down again. It cycles through this emotional roller coaster four times. So let's look at the second. Cut to black. We're then given this slow-mo shot of Link diving down to catch Zelda amidst a fall. The camera is wide to fully capture the lengths Link will go to her, despite clearly not succeeding, and showing us a little more of this mysterious hand reaching out to Link. Now this shot is not new to us audiences, as this shot has become the most used presentation of the game so far, being there even back in the initial teaser trailer. So this is more of a callback to ground us back to this clearly defining and catalytic moment, previously seen more close in. Following that, we continue the emotions of the mishap, their hands very barely brushed together seen close up before Zelda is lost to the void, falling away from us now as we witness disaster from Link's perspective. These are all synonymous shots with making this drop as dramatic as possible, though eagle-eyed fans have noticed Zelda glowing as she falls, so she'll be alright. Ob obviously. Also, considering the fact that these latest Zelda games have been a mishmash hodgepodge homage to the entire Legend of Zelda franchise, you could make comparisons to Skyward Sword, where this exact exchange has happened before. Following that, we have the landscapes of Hyrule, blown out as far wide as possible with a tiny link down there to showcase the scale of this world. And even with the in-game camera, we're looking up to ogle at this new underground area with lava fools to catch our eye. And now we reveal in more cutscenes a fleet of airships, again wide and low angle to highlight scale and value as they loom above and approach Link. The lightning in the back also adding to the atmosphere as it lights up the otherwise dull snowstorm. Following that, we have more gameplay. There's not too much of the camera work, but it's keeping up its objective showcasing spectacle. I don't know what's going on here though. And then it's your classic laser pitfall. Again, it's the in-game camera, but the in-game camera tactically pulls way back as Link super dives, making him a tiny pebble on the frame for ease of maneuverability, as well as to see how large the obstacles around him really are. Gameplay with frame within the frame, you're directed to the negative space as well as the orb dispenser over there for an otherwise mundane mechanic. More frame slicing inside this maze labyrinth. It's a display of the variety of spaces in Tears of the Kingdom, and this one is long and narrow. And as Link spins his spear on horseback, the camera is again low to the ground and swerving around him. The focus isn't on his target or the brewing rebellion of civilians in the world, it's all on Link looking like the hero of the wild. Our last line of defense will be Link. And we're back to cutscene cinematics. This elevator shot has the unique design of not having a roof, so we can easily stare all the way down at Link, imposing upon him as he's seemingly entering new territory. Uneasy. Whilst the lighting of the environment creates this unique ring lighting effect that is just incredible to witness. Way to make an elevator shot interesting. Here's a new character up front and center, with a shallow depth of focus since the background is the least of our worries right now. But there's little motion from them. They remain a mystery with how little information we can get beyond the face. But we know they're incredibly important because... It's another beat drop. And our first inkling of vocals as well. Reversed? Here's Link against the sunset. It's just an artsy shot. Us humans love sunsets and we love silhouettes against them. Following that, we then have this guy coming out of the wall presented at a side angle. Seems a bit odd at first, it's not like the area covering 60% of the frame is particularly exciting to see other than it being unseen territory minus that one shrine challenge, but if it was a head-on shot, you'd barely see the distance this guy is travelling off of his wall. And he probably goes a little further than what we see here in the full thing. 
Here's Link looking dramatically as the camera turns. It's not your usual topic to be looking towards the same side of the frame as they're standing. We typically like our characters to look across the center of the frame, but it can again be put to the shot being cut off early for the trailer. As here he stands in the royal grounds, widely shot as we're focused on the room, not the person. And this is the climax of the second round. Not what you'd expect from visuals alone, but listening with the soundtrack and... Yeah, it certainly is. As we cut to black again, let's switch over to our fourth round now. The finale finale, starting not from a cut to black, but from an explosion. Lovely. As it's Zelda again, now stood in the overworld of Hyrule looking at her palms. It's a pseudo-angelic shot, judging by the composition of the blue sky, bright sunlight, and her dressed in sacred clothing. But the camera isn't moving to pedestal her, staying static instead as Zelda is clearly brooding over her duty and ability. She's unsure of herself, not some ease of access hero, but one who struggles to achieve what her fate tells her. But as the hand pose leads us into the question, what she got, we next get it answered as we see up close, a tear of the kingdom. Clearly the symbolic piece of this entire game given it's in the title, and that's always meant it's important in the past. And you can catch the master sword behind her, so clearly the two are connected. People suspect she's tasked with fixing this master sword as it was shattered in the prologue. And with the quiet conflict of doubt out of the way, it's time for final confrontation time as we briefly catch Ganondorf blazing into the sky, unending malice from his hair, tilting the camera up to both see what's going on up there, as well as to view it as an oppressive, overbearing entity. And match cut to another beam of malice light breaching into the sky and spreading outwards. This could easily be from the same cutscene, but it uses a match cut in its malice effects. From there, the Blood Moon rises once again, and just like the initial game, is displayed as the camera pulling backwards as more and more enemies appear out of the red, consistently adding a new foreground for the camera to capture as it makes its way backwards still. Though this time we've got Lionel's appearing too, crashing onto the ground with a little camera shake to boot. Nice. Gonna need more of that canonical link strength. And as it stops at Lionel's, it tilts up to them too for that money shot of three incredibly strong enemies all appearing at once. Next we have some story beats we can stitch together. The Master Sword being attacked by Malice, close up, panning across the blade to Link's arm as the Malice consumes all from the right hand side. Also well directed as video games have always taught us, heroes are on the left and villains are to the right. But as the malice grows, it also envelops up Link's arm, tilting up as we spot his face reacting and his shoulder turning black, before revealing it more as a wide angle, now with a full view of the whole sword consumed and Link not doing too hot either. All this we can infer takes place as part of the prologue to the whole game, mostly presented from that first teaser trailer. And from that catalyst of an event, the Master Sword is broken and must be prepared, whilst Link gains new abilities from his now energized hand of some sort. Or that comes from the mysterious hand also in this scene. But here's the real money shot, a big green hand emanating malice, followed by another in the opposite direction. That iconic cloak also making an appearance, and following up with everyone's screaming husband, Ganondorf. Starting as a mid shot to catch all of his topless glory before closing in on just his face as his forehead glows brightest on the frame. One more tear and a clear guttural roar of malice. What a way to reveal him. You witness a king's revival and the birth of his new world. Shown first with the immediate consequence of his mere presence actively targeting the hero and then later showing him obscured by only limbs and then right up close and personal. Stitching these two events together does such a good job on thematically covering the historic Ganondorf. And in juxtaposition to that, we then have Link journeying to eventually take him down. Running from bosses at low angles, falling with Tulin, tilting from a dramatic angle in the sky, directly in front of a new new character with some light power it seems, as well as a beam that shreds through several desert creatures. This moment is a showcase of all the notable characters assisting on this great challenge. But you are not alone. 
read you dance fighting, now a little aged up, lightning shaking the camera, civilians forming rebel groups regardless of species, and Link as a supporter, and a sneak peek at the Sky Island in the back. Sidon fighting alongside Link against the construct as it's cool to top one of these Sky Islands, as Link gets a close up looking ahead to the champion's descendants together in one scene tears in hand, running towards their target, before ending it off with Link running directly towards an iconic retro boss, reimagined anew with the Fire Gleok from the original game. This round thematically has been all about the big bad evil finally making its reveal, and the rise up of the kingdom and all of its inhabitants working together to take down this next big bad calamity, before cooling down one final time with Zelda again as she stands with the Master Sword in hand begging for success from herself and her knight. Logo plays suspiciously looped, making more people think this leads into Skyward Sword at the very start of the Zelda timeline again, as we see her in the post credits looking up to the sky, still angelic, wishing for Link to find her as the damsel in distress she's always relegated to, it seems. I know why I am here. It's... something only I can do. But we're not done yet, let's see round three now. We've cut to black from Hyrule Castle and slow faded into Zelda as she stands in Zonai territory. The ancient species of advanced technology, don't worry about it. But she stands looking up against a great pedestal, yet again dealing with an overbearing task and heaps of doubt. Is it finding the Master Sword or that tear from earlier? We can see something glowing over time, but who knows? <clears throat> Trailers keeping the mystery up as we then cut to the Master Sword itself. Hmm, interesting choice there. But this is as it stood safe at Kokiri Forest, showing it in its glorified state just as Link takes it from the helm. With that thematically at the front of Zelda's mind, represented visually, we then have her approached by some character. I don't know if it's good guy arm guy, or that unspeaking one, or heck, even Ganondorf who could have captured her, judging by the large cloak, despite them saying, We rely on your knight, and that legendary sword he carries. But my job's not to work that out, thankfully. It's probably Rauru, this guy, who is probably also the hand. The mystery is held up by a tactical cropping of their head to obscure their identity, and of course some more brooding shots of Zelda, always at a side angle, as she looks up with hope. And as we thematically turn our attention to Link, there he is. Empowered from the low angle as he flies before Hyrule is ogled at some more at this super wide high angle shot, basked in sunset bloom and mystically misty clouds. It's just nice on the eyes. And we're back to gameplay. Low angle shield bashing to highlight that mechanic, gliding towards a giant bull sky island, fighting against a Goron boss, flying, jumping with Tulin towards the skies, escorting civilians on cart, reversing Octorok boulders, jumping high with a rocket punch, anti gravity platforming, a minecart enemy battle, a mecha mini boss, fire arrows on horseback, and laser disco on a Bokoblin camp. All of it is just a high paced montage of gameplay mechanics and intrigue, each shown at the best angle for added effect. After all, none of this is shown at night time. It's not that it would be bad, it's just not optimum. But as we blaze through this gameplay meet in the middle, we then end off on yet another climax, this time from gameplay rather than story. A giant ice super boss you'll have to fight with Tulin. Yet another ferocious enemy will have to overcome, and a malicious explosion for added effect. And alright, we've skimmed over it enough, this won't take long. Let's tackle the first round of the trailer. Having the slowest, peacefulest start to ease us in, it starts with a variety of landscape shots to Ogolat, scanning through clouds to reveal the lands, slow swerving wide angles of the islands below and the skylier islands above. There's side topics of constructs reacting with their environments. Thematically, it's the introduction of this new Hyrule before Link comes crashing from up top it all. The camera movement going absolutely ham for this one shot, diagonal, twirling around Link, practically going sideways on him, closing in before pulling out just in view for the title card to pop up. Now Link is in the corner rather than the title, like in Breath of the Wild. 
I personally wouldn't be surprised if this is this game's same moment. All this camera motion is in-engine, so why wouldn't this be the in-game title card? You wake up, realize Zelda is out there, you're aged and up high, now jump down and get started. And as he whips out his paraglider, we're again getting spectacles of Hyrule. Thematically following Link, he lands and runs to new territory. Open fields with new backgrounds, a refurbished Hatano village, a new camp showing signs of rebuilding at Hyrule Castle. All linking into this idea that the world is healing and new on top of what was already known. But gameplay is familiar, as Link is now climbing a mountain. Next, the camera scans across this pathway and past Link as it observes up to the storm clouds up in the mountains. And then... Cuts to Storm in the Desert, with a dramatic drop in the soundtrack. The first dip in the trailer to lead from peace to action where a new temple is growing out of the sand. We've moved our topic onto the changes of the world, perhaps for the bad, as Hyrule Castle rises from the ground and debris falls from the sky, widening out to see how far it's visible from before this eclectic malice shot. Just brimming with red malice with that super blood moon as perhaps the source of this climax moment, like a Sozin's comet of the Legend of Zelda world. Or maybe it's even a force field around Hyrule Castle, a little like Twilight Princess. Regardless, it's our big bad again, coming in with heavy drum beats, with such long luscious hair some people think it might not even be Ganondorf, but Demise, yet another connection to Skyward Sword at the start of the timeline. But just before he can turn for an identity check, we cut to black, not silently, but climactically. This first round has been about introducing us to Hyrule, its lands, changes, and challenges, whilst the second round takes us back to the roots of the story, the prologue catalyst event that kicks off our villain story, princess story, and hero story, as we see the gameplay consequences of that and what are the goals along that journey. Next, round three follows the princess dilemma as she comes to terms with her tasks and the world's contexts before beaming hope onto Link doing a little bit of everything for us to get hyped for as round four takes us to the finale as we witness the Tears of the Kingdom, the biggest malice of them all, the challenges that disadvantage even our hero, and the revived villain of our entire premise. With a stick on determination as we see the immediate representation of rebelling against this evil oppression, ending it off with one final ominous challenge for both Link and for Zelda. A final call to action for the night, and also us as audience eager to hop on to yet another legendary adventure. And that's why I called this video the scene that changed Tears of the Kingdom, because it is telling a story. Across three minutes is covering all of the thematic beats of the experience you are meant to take away, and it does so in a way that is a true masterclass in marketing with all of the moving beats it has moving together. And not to mention the perfect cinematography for every single shot across the entire four minute runtime. And that's without me even gushing about the soundtrack the entire time. You can never be disappointed when Nintendo whips out the saxophone. <laughs> But for what was supposed to be a mini episode of mine, this sure has gone on a little while, so I'll leave it off here. You know, I made a whole 100% Let's Play of this game across six months when this game came out. Maybe if there's intrigue, I'll do some sort of stream with a new game, but we'll just have to see. And maybe more relevant game breakdowns. Maybe the super underperforming cutscene series has room for a return. We'll see. You'll just have to let me know. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. You are our final hope.